Bergen uh, to ask the Secretary of State for Justice to make a statement on his government's plans for HMP Birmingham. Minister Rory Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to begin by paying tribute to the work of the Chief Inspector, in particular in relation to Birmingham and indeed his entire inspection team. The situation in HMP Birmingham was simply unacceptable. It was shocking in terms of the levels of violence. It was shocking in terms of the response to those levels of violence. It was shocking in terms of the drugs. It was shocking in terms of basic decency. The situation in Birmingham has, of course, been of considerable concern for some time. I visited personally in the week before the inspector issued the report for that reason. The Secretary of State for Justice, the Lord Chancellor, also made a personal visit to Birmingham. The Chief Executive of the Prison Service also visited Birmingham. And the reason for this is that over the last few weeks and months, we have been increasingly concerned about G4S's inability to turn around the situation. The steps that we took were initially to issue a notice to improve, followed by a second notice to improve. I then held meetings with G4S in London in which they replaced their governor, the governor who had been in for 18 months and brought in a new governor. They then brought in a new team. We came up with a new action plan and a new team was brought in by the ministry to work alongside them. Notwithstanding all the steps that Birmingham took and G4S took over those months, the conclusion that we reluctantly reached uh, in the week before the inspector published his urgent notification was that G4S would not be able on their own to turn around the significant problems of Birmingham. Therefore, the decision was made to take the unprecedented step of the government stepping in and taking over control. That means, in effect, Mr Speaker, Three things. Firstly, we have brought in a highly experienced governor from the public sector, Mr Paul Newton, who has taken over as the governor of the prison. Secondly, we have reduced by 300 prisoners the number of prisoners in Birmingham prison, which has allowed us to take key cells out of operation and allow us to renovate those cells. And thirdly, we have brought in an additional 32 highly experienced public sector prison staff in order to support the team on the ground. Now, all of this will be done with no cost to the taxpayer. And I'd like to take this opportunity also to say that notwithstanding the very significant problems at Birmingham, there are dedicated, serious professional staff on the ground who have been facing a very difficult situation. There have been real challenges around drugs and leadership, we are confident that with Paul Newton and the new team and the reduction in numbers, we can stabilise that prison, address the drugs and the violence and turn it around and restore the confidence to the team. Now, I anticipate, Mr Speaker, that this could rapidly become a debate over the merits or otherwise of privatisation, and I am expecting that the Shadow Secretary of State will almost certainly go in that direction. For what it is worth, on this side of the House, we do not believe this is primarily an ideological battle. The situation in Birmingham has been serious for some time. It was a Labour Secretary of State for Justice who initially decided to proceed with the privatisation of Birmingham in 2010, although it was a Conservative Secretary of State who finally left the contract. The company concerned, G4S, has clearly significantly failed in Birmingham. At the same time, as honourable members such as the honourable member for Bridgend can confirm, they are running an impressive prison in Park. They run an impressive prison at Old Course in Liverpool, which is performing well, particularly on education and work, and Park is doing well on family services. The BBC has just produced a very positive report on their performance at Oakwood as well. So this is not primarily about the difference between the public and the private sector. Very sadly, there have been significant challenges also within the public sector, Nottingham Prison, Liverpool and Exeter most recently, and indeed the Chief Inspector for Prisons himself underlined this is not primarily about public against private, but basic issues primarily around drugs, violence and management. And it is those three things that we will be focusing on above all through the step in, and as I said, Mr Speaker, at no cost to the taxpayer. Thank you. Uh, Richard Berger.
I thank you, Mr Speaker, for granting this urgent question and the Minister for his reply. It is clear from the damning reports into HMP Birmingham, as well as the failings in the probation system, that the costly experiment of privatisation in our justice system should be ended. Costs aside, one of the great failings with privatisation is that we in this House struggle to hold these mega corporations like G4S to account. The cloak of commercial confidentiality is used until it is all too late and they can then need rescuing by the state. Despite that, hopefully today we will get some straight answers to straight questions, Mr Speaker. Will the Ministry of Justice be imposing a financial penalty on G4S for their failures at HMP Birmingham? What additional funding will be provided to HMP Birmingham to remedy the current failings? And will any public funding be used going forward to do so? And if so, going forward, will this come from the current MOJ budget? 30 additional Officers will be sent uh, to Birmingham prison. Will the Minister commit to all of the failing prisons, including public sector prisons, getting the same percentage increase in staffing above current levels? Why did his Government decide that HMP Birmingham will not be permanently returned to the public sector? Will the Minister commit to an independent commission today to look at the merits of doing so before handing it back to G4S? Will the Government now halt its plans to build new private prisons? If not, will he at least rule out G4S from bidding for them? And will his government now commit to a wider, independent review of the involvement of private companies in the justice system? Well, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, so, and thank you to the Shadow Secretary of State for justice. These are, of course, very serious questions, and this was a very serious failing in the prison. So to try to take these individual questions one by one. Uh, the question of the financial cost to G4S of us stepping in will be very considerable. G4S already estimates that they are losing on this contract, but they are paid uh, to a great extent on the number of prison places. So, for example, specifically to that question, the removal of 300 prisoners from that prison will have a direct financial penalty imposed on G4S, which will be covered by G4S itself. It is, I can also confirm that the entire costs of this step-in will be covered not by the taxpayer but by G4S because we will withhold the payment that we would normally make in line with the contract to G4S to cover those costs. The next question that was asked by the Shadow Secretary of State for Justice is whether we would put exactly 32 officers into the other challenged prisons. We are not in a position to specify exactly the numbers, but the broad approach that we would take to Birmingham is the same as the approach we would take to the other public sector prisons. And in fact, that approach involves focusing firstly and primarily on the inflow of drugs into those prisons, both in terms of intelligence disruption of organised criminal groups, but also simply things like scanners, and we're putting in a nearly £6 million worth of investment into drug interdiction and scanners. Secondly, basic decency, nearly £30 million of extra investment is going into living conditions within our prisons. Thirdly, a focus on education. The Secretary of State's education employment strategy is central to this, both in terms of giving prisoners purposeful activity within the prison walls, but also ensuring that they get jobs on release, reducing reoffending and protecting the public. And finally, and perhaps most importantly of all, supporting our very hard-working prison officers with the right training, leadership and management skills. It's an incredibly tough job that they're doing outside prison doors, particularly with new psychoactive substances coming in. They're facing unprecedented levels of challenges, and we really need to support them. Support them both in terms of the bill which was brought in by the Right Honourable Member for Rhonda, in terms of doubling the sentences for people assaulting prison officers and other emergency workers, but also supporting them with additional training before they go on the wings and supporting training as they continue. The question of an independent commission. Respectfully, I would argue that we understand very well already what happened at Birmingham Prison without the need of an additional independent report. The Independent Monitoring Board has produced a very full report on Birmingham Prison. The Chief Inspector of Prisons has produced a very full report. We have looked very closely at Birmingham Prison over the last few weeks and months. 
Unfortunately, the story in Birmingham Prison was a relatively familiar one. It is about drugs, it is about violence, and it is about management and training. There's no great secret there. And as for the question of G4S bidding for future contracts, that's, of course, a hypothetical question for future contracts, which will not be let in the case of future prisons for a number of years. But we will, of course, in accordance with all our rules, look very seriously at companies, including G4S, their past record and performance, before considering them for a tender. Mr Robert Neal. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Minister and the Secretary of State are to be commended upon the very prompt and swift action that was taken here, well, and the Minister personally upon his very swift uh, involvement. And I thank him for contacting me as Chair of the Select Committee so swiftly upon it. Would he agree that there is no pattern that emerges clearly on the evidence that there is any distinction uh, of the problems that arise in our prisons as to the public or private nature of their ownership and management? But there are two patterns that do emerge. One is a consistent history of failing in our old Victorian local prisons, be they run by public or private sector. And secondly, a persistent failure by the prison service, again, whether operating directly or through contract, to act upon the recommendations of Her Majesty's Inspectorate. That's a litany that's picked up by the Chief Inspector. What is the government going to do to address those two clear patterns of failure? Uh, and Mr. Speaker, if I can take those two questions separately. Uh, on the question of responding to recommendations of the inspectors, we have, and the Secretary of State for Justice has driven this through, changed the way in which our management systems work to put the inspectors' recommendations and the inspectors' reports at the heart of the way we set objectives for the prison service. And we would expect the House to see in the future that the way that we manage those prisons much more closely reflects those inspection reports rather than the past system where we had our own independent assessment. Secondly, on the question of old Victorian buildings, there clearly is a pattern there. It is not an absolute pattern. There are very old buildings like Stafford, which are well-run, good prisons. There are new prisons, like, for example, Nottingham, which have managed to get themselves in trouble despite new buildings. But yes, generally speaking, running an old Victorian prison adds to your problems, and we should make sure that in our investment for 10,000 new places, we endeavour to remove the worst affected prisons from our system. Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is clear that prisons in England and Wales are suffering from excessive budget pressures, inconsistent policy, uh, and a lack of direction. Now, I know the Minister visited the prison system in Scotland recently, and while prison staffing levels in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland have fallen by around a third since 2010, in Scotland they have increased by 14%. And in Scotland, we have minimised cuts to our justice system, resulting in an all-time 43-year uh, crime uh, low in Scotland. And overcrowding has been addressed by the Scottish Government's successful presumption against short-term uh, custodial sentences, which has been increased to 12 months today in the Scottish Government's uh, programme for government. So what I am wondering... Uh, Mr. Speaker, is whether the Minister can tell us, having visited Scotland recently, what lessons from the experience of successful prison reform in Scotland does he intend to apply to the system in England and Wales? Well, Mr. Speaker, firstly, I should genuinely pay tribute to some of the things that are happening in Scotland in relation to prisons. I was privileged to visit HMP Perth, which is a very good example of a busy, challenged local prison that is being run well. Uh, the prison officers, of course, uh, in Scotland would also say that there have been very significant cuts since the early 2000s in relation to the number of prison officers, and they too have had to make very serious efficiency savings, and they have done it well, and they are running good prisons. The other thing that I would say is that we are watching very closely what is happening on uh, short sentences in Scotland. As with the Scottish Government, our priority is, of course, to protect the public, but the evidence on what can be done to reduce reoffending by not overusing short prison sentences inappropriately is a very good lesson from Scotland from which we wish to learn. Sir Desmond Swain. Prisoners who are at leisure to consume and trade spice would benefit from penal servitude with hard labour. Will he bring it back? <laughs> uh, no. Khalid Mahmoud. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With, with your permission, if I may first uh, provide some information, 
about my colleague Shibana Mahmood, the member for Ladywood, whose uh, prison, whose constituency this prison is in. Unfortunately, she is in a meeting where I'm not sure whether she had the notice of this urgent question. So if I can apologise in terms of her not being here. My question to the Minister simply is, my question to the Minister simply is, he's made a huge commitment to clean out prisons. The real issues in prisons is about the staff, the training of the staff, and not allowing drugs or other substances to be allowed into those prisons. That will require resources. How will he ensure that? Well, thank you, Speaker. Well, the first thing, of course, absolutely right. It is about staff. We are, now have 3,000 prison officers more than the moment at which we made the announcement, so more staff will make a difference. The next stage is getting the training right, and particularly the training for the Band 5 and Band 4 staff, who are the uniformed staff out there day in, day out on the landings. And that will be both getting a staff college right for governors, but making sure that in places like Newport Revel, our training college, we have the right support for our prison officers. It's an amazing profession, but it needs support and training. Ed Vasey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the uh, Minister that this isn't a debate about uh, privatised or publicly run prisons, but it is obviously about how we uh, work to ensure that we don't have trouble like this again. And may I uh, echo what my uh, honourable friend, the Chairman of the Justice Committee, said about the need to carry on that vision of reinvigorating the prison estate. But may I also echo the Minister's comments about education. I think the great opportunity in our prisons is to work with prisoners to use, for example, culture and sport uh, to give prisoners opportunities. We're dealing with people often who have mental health issues and sometimes a lack of education. And it's been shown that the arts and sport can go, do a great deal to help rehabilitate prisoners as opposed to, say, penal servitude. Here, here. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Right Honourable Member is, is encouraging me to reflect on our sports strategy, which is coming through. But broadly speaking, this is also a key point about the way that education changes lives. And through changing lives and helping people to get employment when they leave, reduces reoffending and protects the public. So stabilising our prisons and delivering high quality education in prisons is not just good for prisoners, it's good for the rest of society. Liam Byrne. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A month ago, Mr Speaker, my constituent was beaten within an inch of his life at HMP Birmingham. Not once, but twice. Not in a dark corner, but in the full glare of a video that was then posted on social media. The chaos that G4S presided over in HMP Birmingham was dark, dangerous and violent. And I have to say to the Minister, it is very hard to square a future where this prison is returned to G4S with the level of investment and staffing which is needed in order to ensure Birmingham is a prison that is safe. So will you reflect again on what the Shadow Secretary of State said about the need for an independent commission to stand as a gateway, a test, before any decision is made to put this prison back into the private sector that so desperately failed the people of Birmingham? Minister. So, f firstly, I mean, that, that is a very, very shocking, very immediate illustration of just how horrifying uh, what was happening in Birmingham was. And the Right Honourable Member is absolutely right that when something like that happens, we shouldn't only be taking control back from G4S, but we should be thinking very seriously about before we return it back to them, which is why we're making assurance to the House that we will be taking it over for a minimum of six months, but that's a minimum of six months, and we will be very tough and clear in the decisions we reach at the end of that six months and whether we believe that prison is stable enough to be handed back to G4S for exactly the reasons that the Right Honourable Member has raised. Victoria Prentice. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following on from the previous question, does my honourable friend agree that this debate is not about public or private management of prisons, but in fact about when it is appropriate for government to step in when prisons are failing, and also, if I may say so, when it's appropriate for a responsible minister to take responsibility for the prison service, as I was very pleased to read my honourable friend is willing to do over the summer? Um, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, I th without getting dragged into an ideological discussion against public against private, I think there is a key thing which hopefully both sides of the House can agree on, which is that the best way, if we're going to have privatised systems, for them to operate 
is by having the right degree of government regulation and intervention when things go wrong. We cannot have a system, whether we're talking about water, utilities or indeed prisons, where we don't have a clear government grip. And I hope stepping in in Birmingham demonstrates that the government is prepared to do that when we reach this situation. Good day, the Speaker, the Minister has rightly decided to solve the shocking problems at HMP, per, HMP Birmingham by reducing its prison population and increasing staff numbers. Can I congratulate him on this radical policy and the huge brain power that must have gone into this ingenious solution? <laughs> when will the rest of Britain's crisis prisons benefit from more staff and reduced overcrowding? Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, the, 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 uh, the rebuke has taken. I mean, it's of course absolutely true that, uh, as with any institution, it's easier to run it with more staff and fewer people. But the answer actually in practice is that this is a remedy that we take to stabilise a prison which has reached the situation that Birmingham has reached. Once a prison is stabilised and functioning well, it is possible to run it with a full population. We can see that being done at Alt Course. We can see that being done at Thameside. We can see that being done at a busy, challenged local prison like HMP Hull at the moment. But in the case of Birmingham, it's necessary to take these steps, and the Honourable Member is right that it doesn't take a massive brain to work out that that's the first thing you need to do. John Howell. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. How will he ensure that the new Governor has both the powers and the support to carry out the reform of the prison? Well, this again is a, a very good challenge. Um, that comes down to reasserting in every way, both here in the House and through the management chain, that the Governor is in charge, that we will give them the resources to get behind them, and that we will support them in what they are doing. But it is absolutely right. Only with a properly empowered Governor are we going to achieve that change. Ellie Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prisons Minister suggested over the summer that if he does not achieve a reduction in drugs in prisons by next year, he will resign. The letter from the Secretary of State from the Chief Inspector of Prisons stated that the conditions at HMP Birmingham were among the worst they had ever seen, with many under the influence of drugs. And in April of this year, five prisoners died within the space of seven weeks, which was widely reported. Why didn't ministers intervene then? in what was clearly a prison falling apart and not fit for purpose. So, Mr Speaker, this is a good challenge. Uh, Birmingham was challenged, and we were focused on that situation, and that's why we had put in notices to improve. That's why we'd negotiated to bring in a new governor. That's why we'd put in a new team. A judgment had to be made at what point we decided that G4S did not have the capacity to turn it around on their own and step in. I think we were correct in taking a number of steps before we formally stepped in, but you're absolutely right in challenging whether we could have done it a little earlier or whether we can do it a little later. That, in the end, was the judgment call which we had to make. Mike Wood. Thank you, Mr Speaker. How many prisons have triggered urgent notifications since the system was uh, introduced at the end of last year? And how does that number break down between privately managed prisons and those run in by the public sector? So the inspector has clarified that so far this year, the prisons that have triggered urgent notification have been Exeter and Nottingham. He's clarified that he would have triggered a UN on Liverpool. Birmingham was the fourth, so the answer to that is that three out of the four since the beginning of this year have been from the public sector. Leslie. The Minister's already made reference to the situation at Nottingham Prison in my constituency, which for at least the past year has been going through considerable uh, challenges with uh, not just um, deaths in custody, but also uh, endemic psychoactive substance uh, uh, misuse. Can you just explain uh, and put a timeline on the interventions that he's making and uh, when we will be able to see some improvements in performance? Mr. So the situation in Nottingham Prison has been very concerning, and particularly concerning has been uh, deaths at Nottingham Prison. Uh, we now have a new governor, very, very highly respected professional governor, has come into Nottingham Prison. Tom Wheatley, the previous governor of Nottingham, is, is now moving on uh, to another role. Uh, we would expect to see, within the next six months, the beginning of a turnaround there, and the things to look at in particular will be statistics on drugs and violence. Uh, Gordon Henderson. Uh, Paul Newton is an excellent governor. He was transferred from a prison in my constituency, Swalsea. Swalsea itself has its own problems. What assurances can the minister give me that the transfer of Mr Newton is not going to be detrimental to my uh, local prison? 
Well, the answer is that we have to be cognizant of that. But the prison service is a large system. So we have currently over 20,000 prison officers moving 32 staff although it will challenge some of the prisons from which it's removed, should be accommodated within our prison system. We have a lot of other talented governors, and we remain confident that the need in Birmingham is greater than the need at Swellside, and we will make sure that Paul Newton is replaced with a highly effective governor. Emma Reynolds. Okay. In his view, how on earth did G4S management of HMP Birmingham manage to lose some control of the prison so dramatically? And what is the Minister going to do about the poor retention of experienced officers with um, those leaving their jobs doubling in the last two years? So the, the fundamental factor that really triggered the change at Birmingham was that in December 2016, one of the prison officers managed to lose their keys, which led to nearly 200 prisoners being unlocked and a riot in Birmingham. So G4S had been improving that prison over the previous three years, and that really knocked the bottom out of it. It had a devastating effect on morale, and as the Right Honourable Member implies, it led to a lot of staff, experienced staff, then leaving that prison. And looking back over that period, although the Chief Inspector for Prison ourselves had hoped things were beginning to improve, during 2017, that I think in the end turned out to be a false promise, and that the blow of that December 2016 event is something from which we're still recovering. Mr. Richard Drax. Mr. Speaker, I have huge confidence in my honourable friend, but I don't have confidence in the prisoners' officers that he and the government are employing staying on. The facts speak for themselves, and I agree entirely with the honourable member for Rhonda. Many of my prison officers, and I'm sure across the prison estate, are very concerned they are not, they don't have the proper discipline, protection and all the other things in place to look after them. Can he assure the House that he'll look at this and make sure, for example, if a prison officer is assaulted, the assaulter is jailed for a much longer period of time, for example? So this is absolutely the right challenge. So the Right Honourable Member for Rhonda introduced a private member's bill which has doubled the a maximum sentence available for assaulting a prison officer. But it's not enough just to double the maximum sentence. We need to make sure that the police and the Crown Prosecution Service work together to bring those prosecutions. There are too many incidents still today of prison officers being assaulted. They are hard-working, serious, professional public servants with a very, very challenging life. We owe them a duty of care. We must prosecute people who assault them. Chris Bryant. I, of course, fully agree with the points that have just been made, but can I ask about brain injury in this prison? Because all the work that's been done in Leeds Prison shows that there's a very high incidence in the prison population of traumatic brain injury, and the work that's been done in a pilot um, in Cardiff Prison shows that you can make dramatic differences to people's re-offending if you actually screen everybody coming onto the secure estate and then provide them with full neuro-rehabilitation. Will that be available in Her Majesty's prison in Birmingham? Yeah. Well, I'd like to pay tribute, Mr Speaker, to the work the Right Honourable Member for Ronda has done on this particular issue. And in fact, what I'd like to do is to offer to sit down immediately with the Right Honourable Member to discuss exactly the findings and look at how we can apply them to Birmingham. Vicky Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Like Birmingham Prison, the prison in Chelmsford has some very ancient Victorian wings and the staff numbers had got very low. But the staff numbers have now increased. Can my honourable friend um, agree that the staff need the support in training and ongoing mentoring and tutoring? And will he ensure that those new staff get that support? Absolutely. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the Honourable Member for Chelmsford, who has made, I think, seven visits to Chelmsford Prison and has worked very closely with the new acting governor in the steps that are being taken to turn around. Uh, I, 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 hes I hesitate to add, as, as, as a visitor. Um, the key point, though, that she raises is the point about mentoring, and in particular the roles that more experienced prison officers at Band 4 can play in providing the day-to-day -day model for the staff and the partnership for the staff on the ground to teach them the jail craft, which is essential for everybody's safety and ultimately for turning around lives. Alex Norris. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's clear that drugs have played a significant role in the problems in Birmingham. Similarly, drugs have played a significant role in the challenges in Nottingham and, I suspect, across the prison estate. 
what is the latest assessment that the prisons minister has made about the use of body scanners? What is the latest legal advice he has been given about how widely they can be used? So there have been challenges historically about the use of body scanners. We have now gone through the legal advice very clearly. I am very clear that body scanners can be used and ought to be used much more frequently. We therefore have made an almost £6 million investment in additional scanning. This will allow us to detect, as we do already at Belmarsh, people carrying drugs inside their body as well as drugs carried on their person. This has to go along with new scanners that we are bringing in to detect mail, which can be infused with spice, and all the work that we are doing to combat drones and other ways of getting drugs into prison. Protective security measures must also go along with demand reduction and therapy, but without protective security, we cannot get on top of the drugs epidemic. Yes. Mr. Philip Holloway. Well. Offences are committed in prison. If drugs are peddled in prison, then appropriate punishment needs to be meted out to those who are responsible and the ringleaders removed. Now, if you won't bring back hard labour, will you at least look? at the punishment regime so that prison officers and inmates who obey the rules can regard prisons as a safe place to be, because at the moment it sounds to me as if the government is losing control. Well, this is a very, very good challenge. So, Mr Speaker, there are two fundamental issues to this. One is the nature of the punishment that you impose, and that, in the case of somebody who is dealing drugs in prison, that is a criminal offence. So we would expect that person to proceed to court and receive extra days or extra years of sentence for importing drugs into a prison. And that should, not be, cons- that should be consecutive, not concurrent sentence. But the second and most important issue is consistency. We need to ensure that any punishments inflicted are predictable and consistent. And we need to do it not just in drugs, but we need to challenge low-level disruptive behaviour consistently if we are to turn around the culture in our most troubled prisons. Maria Eagle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given that the Minister has accepted that in the short term, at least, increasing the number of staff and cutting the number of prisoners is a way of stabilising the situation, is he going to make sure, if he, hands this, if he does hand this prison back to G4S, which I don't think he should do, but if he does, that they don't immediately then cut the staffing levels again, because that's how they make their money. So this is a very good point. We need to make sure both that if it's stabilised through this, the plan that takes it forward respects those ratios, and if they're reduced, it's done on an evidence base. Uh, The Right Honourable Lady is absolutely right to point to the danger of doing that suddenly after the takeover. Michael Tomlinson. Speaker, the Minister has reduced the number of prisoners at HMP Birmingham. Will he look seriously at reducing the number of prisoners right across the prison estate and focus instead, relentlessly focus, on rehabilitation? For victims and for those serving sentences of under 12 months, prison isn't working. Well, thank the Honourable Member very much for the question. It is, of course, true that we have evidence that shows clearly that there is a higher incidence of reoffending from people in short prison sentences than people that serve community sentences. And this is why the example from the Government of Scotland is very relevant. The best way of preventing the public is by reducing reoffending. Putting people unnecessarily into prison in a way that damages them and does not change their lives and leads to reoffending when they leave is not in the prison's interest, is not in the public purse's interest, and ultimately is not in the interests of public safety. Uh, Rebecca Powell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would my right honourable friend agree that tackling the problems in prisons is important, but it's very important to reduce those actually ending up in prison? Recent data shows that two-thirds of all young offenders have got speech, language and communication disorders. Surely, if we could focus more on this in the early years, we could reduce young people ever finding their way to prison. Well, Mr Speaker, this is absolutely right. So, A lot of people who are offending and ending up in prison come from very, very difficult backgrounds. We've got a situation at the moment in prisons where nearly half of our prisoners have been excluded from school at some time, compared to only 2 per cent of the general population. We've got a situation where almost 40 per cent of the people in prison currently have a reading age under 11, and a very significant number have a reading age under 6. 
addressing these problems in early years are going to be vital if we are going to be reducing offending. Mary Glyndon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Birmingham is one of the four most violent prisons in England and Wales, and they are all privately operated. Does the Minister agree that this level of violence is logically a consequence of running prisons for profit where costs are cut to the bone to maximise returns for shareholders. Um, so, uh, very respectively, to, to push back, um, the, the Chief Inspector of Prisons, in fact, argues that uh, Exeter Prison is the place where the steepest increase in violence has happened, which sadly is a public sector prison. So, yes, it's true. We have very significant problems in Birmingham, which is a private prison. We also have significant problems in Exeter, which is a public prison. The drivers of this is not public against private. It's drugs, it's violence, and ultimately it's the management, leadership, culture, and the support for the staff on the ground. And these problems can happen whatever the particular model. Eddie Hughes. I understand that Old Corp prison that the Minister referred to was inspected in November 2017. In the report published in March of this year, the Chief Inspector of Prisons described an excellent staff culture and said that almost all interactions between staff and inmates were positive. Does this show that the private sector does have a role to play in running prisons? So, Mr Speaker, Alt, Alt Course Prison is a G4S prison. It is run by the same company that is being criticised in Birmingham. And as the Honourable Member has pointed out, that is a prison which I saw directly has incredibly good education facilities, workshops, had a good inspection report, and is showing how you can run a safe, clean, orderly regime that is genuinely changing lives, and do that through the private sector. And James Cartledge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I pay you a, a tribute to the way my honourable friend is handling this very difficult and sensitive matter. But wherever the private sector is involved in uh, provision of public services, of course, the tendering process is absolutely critical. Can he assure me that where there are any future tenders uh, for prisons, including this one, that he will ensure that anyone bidding has to show they have the capacity to avoid losing control of the prisons in their charge? Yeah, yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, this is a fundamental challenge, and of course, it's central to anything that happens with the government working with the private sector. We must make sure that the tender process ensures that the people bidding for any of these contracts have the credibility, the legitimacy, and the capacity to run these contracts effectively. Thank you. The point of order relates to these exchanges.